Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the weekly seminar series at the Dadla Institute for Global Health Research. My name is Professor Mary Viktorovich, and I'm the interim director of the Dadla Institute, while James Lubinsky is away this year on sabbatical. And today, we're delighted to host Dr. Yenupipi Pini Joyce Adams, who will lead today's seminar entitled Focused Postpartum Care, a Group Postpartum Care Model Improves Outcomes for Women. And as of our usual practice, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. So this is a hybrid event, so uh, please take the time to give thanks and respect to the land on which you're currently living and working if you're off-site here at York. But here at York, uh, we're situated on the traditional territorial area known as Tukoronto and acknowledge its current treaty holders, uh, including the, um, uh, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. We acknowledge this as a traditional territory of many indigenous nations, including the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and the Métis. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. So let's begin with a brief introduction to our speaker. Um, Inupini Joyce Adams is an assistant professor of practice at the Global Maternal Research and, and the Global Maternal Research Lead for the Eck Institute for Global Health at the University of Notre Dame. Her research addresses maternal health disparities that lead to mortality through developing interventions that can be adopted into existing systems of care. She is a PI and co-investigator on multiple projects and has experience conducting patient-focused research, examining both patient and healthcare facility factors that influence access to quality postpartum education. So in today's seminar, Joyce will discuss Sub-Saharan Africa's high rate of maternal mortality and the importance of creating postpartum care systems that allow providers to identify and treat complications by offering evidence-based practice. She'll explain the development of the focused postpartum care model that provides integrated postpartum care education and support for women up to a year after delivery. Joyce will also share the clinical trial results of the model that can enhance maternal health, promote safe motherhood, and decrease maternal mortality. So this is a one hour and 15 minute event that will end at about 1, uh, 2.15. We'll start with a 40-minute presentation with Joyce that will be followed by a Q&A and discussion and wrap up and conclude around 2.10. So for those who are in person, um, please note that there are microphones along the table and that will pick up the sound uh, when you speak. And for those who are viewing via Zoom, um, note that the seminar will be recorded. And please mute your microphone unless presenting or asking questions or answering a question, and use the raise hand button or chat function to ask a question. So I'd now like to ask Joyce to begin our presentation. Over to you. Thank you so much. And first of, all, first of all, I'd like to thank the Dadali Institute for the invitation to come here and present my work. And also thank you to everyone who has made it in person, and also those of you guys joining us online. Um, for making the time to attend this presentation. Today, I'm going to be sharing um, work that we've done on developing a new postpartum care model and how we were able to test it in Ghana and some of the outcomes that we saw from implementing this new model of care. So before I begin, um, I think it's appropriate to start with a brief background um, on maternal mortality. The World Health Organization defines maternal mortality as the death of a woman while pregnant or within 42 days of termination of pregnancy. Um, and that is just my shortened <laughs> brief definition. And maternal mortality is actually still a major global health challenge. And if we look at the numbers, every single day, 800 women die from causes related to pregnancy and childbirth around the world. To put that in perspective, to say that there's a maternal death every two minutes. And so think about the length of the 
and the number of women who would have died by the end of this seminar. The vast majority of maternal deaths occur in low and lower middle income countries. However, Sub-Saharan Africa carries the greatest burden of maternal mortality and actually accounts for 70% of global maternal mortality. If you take a look at the map here, um, this is just a visual to show you what um, it looks like across the world and the fact that Sub-Saharan African countries carry the greatest burden of maternal death. So the very blue color indicates low maternal mortality and, um, and then it goes up until the very red, which indicates extremely high maternal mortality of greater than 1,000 maternal deaths per 100,000 life births. We know that you know, maternal health is, a, is part of the current global goal, sustainable development goal. And goal three, which is on good health and well-being, its very first target is to reduce the global maternal mortality ratio to below 70 deaths per 100,000 life births. And I think that if we are to accomplish this global goal, we really need to focus on countries where the great priority is here, but then also um, look at you know inequities within countries as If you think about the spectrum of maternal um, health, we have antenatal care or prenatal care, labor and delivery, and the time period after delivery known as the postpartum period. This postpartum period after childbirth is the time of highest risk for morbidity and mortality. The postpartum period is defined as the time from one hour after delivery of the placenta to six weeks after delivery of the baby. But as we've continued to look at data over time, we now know that you know, um, women need care up until one year after delivery because there's a lot more morbidity and mortality occurring um, beyond that six-week time frame up until one year after delivery. So we now have what is termed as the late postpartum period. It's that time frame from six weeks to one year after delivery. The majority of maternal deaths occur during this postpartum period. And obstetric complications are the leading causes of direct maternal death, which direct maternal death meaning causes directly re resulting from the pregnancy or its management. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the leading causes are hemorrhage, hypertension, and sepsis. So in order to, for us to be able to decrease maternal mortality rates, we really have to focus on this postpartum period. Quality postpartum care is critical for us to be able to identify and manage complications. But in addition to care, quality postpartum education is also important to minimize risk. Women need to know, okay, what is normal recovery. They need to know what to do for self-care. And they also need to be aware of potential um, post-birth complications and their warning signs so that they can be able to identify and seek care in a timely manner. However, postpartum care is often the neglected aspect of maternity care. It seems that you know once the baby is born and the mom seems to be doing well, that is the end of her care, um, which should not be the case. And one of the reasons I think that we are seeing uh, we are continuing to experience high rates of maternal mortality. Several studies in developing countries have found that most postpartum women have inadequate knowledge of danger signs of complications. Um, we have gotten to a point where women are staying shorter and shorter in the health facilities after delivery. And so, um, I mean, in a lot of the settings that I do my work, women are going home in as early as six hours after delivery. So once a woman leaves the facility, the burden is on her family to be able to identify when something is wrong um, and to be able to seek care in a timely manner. So women's knowledge of danger signs of complications is important and quality um, postpartum education can be a strategy to increase knowledge of warning signs and potentially um, identify and manage cases early. So before we set out to even um, do this intervention, intervention, I must say that I've done a couple of descriptive studies um, over the years on 
um, use of postpartum care services, quality of postpartum care in health facilities, um, midwives' knowledge of postpartum care and education. And all of those um, um, studies have been published, so um, feel free to you know, check out my publication profile. But before we you know, did this particular intervention, we needed to do a needs assessment within the setting. And so um, we conducted focus group discussions with postpartum women from the four health centers in Tamil Ghana. Women were recruited during their postnatal care or PNC visits. And so this picture here um, is what it looks like when women show up for PNC. And so we, you know, re approached women, recruited them for these focus group discussions, and then once they were done with their PNC visits, women who um, consented to participate in the focus group discussions were agreed, and then we held those focus group discussions. So we had eight focus groups conducted using semi-structured guide, and at the end, there were six themes that emerged from the analysis. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go over the entire study, but this has been published in BMC Pregnancy and Childbirth. So if you want to read more about it, um, it's available. But then um, just a summary of some of the things that came up from that needs assessment. Um, the biggest thing was that postpartum care is primarily perceived as care for the baby. So women didn't even think of themselves, right, when you ask them about postpartum care. It was more of newborn care, taking care of the baby, taking care of the child. But not only that, it was also their experiences of postpartum care. And so that was what they experienced when they went to the facilities, that, okay, it was about, you know, weighing the baby, giving baby immunizations, baby-focused education, right? Um, and so we found that care was missing key information on physical recovery and mental health care for the mother. And um, women also had really low rates of knowledge of postpartum danger signs. The biggest barrier that women talked about during the focus group discussions was interpersonal dynamics with health care workers and mostly being negative interactions between them and healthcare providers, you know, um, not being paid attention to healthcare workers being on their cell phones instead of attending to them, um, more treatment, et cetera. And finally, participants also discussed mental health concerns that were indicative of possible or potential postpartum depression, anxiety, and traumatic stress. So based on um, this assessment that we did, we set out to develop an innovative integrated group postpartum care education and support model entitled Focus Postpartum Care, Focus PPC, um, for short going forward, for postpartum women up to one year after delivery. And then to implement and evaluate this model in a parallel randomized controlled trial with 192 postpartum women at those same four health centers in Tamale, where we did the needs assessment. And um, 192 is not a magic number, it was actually um, based on our sample size calculation. So I'm going to then um, dive in and talk about Focus PPC, our integrated postpartum care education and support model for women in Ghana. I'd like to um, acknowledge our funding sources for this work. This project was funded by the Indiana Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute um, with matching funding from the Egg Institute for Global Health and additional funding from the Helen Kellogg Institute for International Studies and the Ford Program in Human <laughs> Development Studies at the University of Notre Dame. This work is also in partnership with my in-country uh, partner organization, Savannah Signatures. Savannah Signatures is a non-profit for impact organization that has been working in this setting since 2009. Um, and uh, my co-PI is Dr. Stephen Albenio, who is the Executive Director of Savannah Signatures. So let me walk you through the development process of this postpartum care. Um, we had, you know, initial inception meetings with the Ghana Health Service at the district and regional level, um, and then went ahead to um, meet with them on a content development workshop. Um, we developed our focus postpartum care guide, um, which went through multiple. Created audio and visual content, 
translated that content into the local language before we actually implement it. So I'm going to walk you through each of these steps. First, engagement with Ghana Health Service. So we had to have um, initial inception meetings with the GHS um, at the regional level and the district level to talk about this um, project and the fact that we wanted to be able to implement this um, in health facilities in the Sagnarugu district. And um, those inception meetings then led to GHS coming on board to work with us um, to develop content for our focus postpartum care model. So we had a content development workshop with representatives from the Ghana Health Service. There was the um, deputy regional director of public health, the regional training coordinator, the um, regional municipal pub regional public health nurse, municipal public health nurse, um, and other representatives in addition to Savannah Signatures. And during this content development workshop, the goal was to develop the overall focus postpartum care content areas and also determine which content areas should be discussed at which time point postpartum. So um, there were a couple of, this, the workshop was led by the regional training coordinator, and so there were a couple of content um, that came up. I mean, before we dived in, we presented our results from the NIF assessment to GHS, and the Deputy Director of Public Health also presented GHS policies on um, postpartum care for moms and babies. And so then, um, you know, the, it was more like, okay, what does Ghana Health Service want women to know after they've had their babies? So um, these were, you know, some of the broad areas, recovery and self-care, potential complications, mental health, interconception care, social support, newborn care, and nutrition. So each of these broad areas were further taken um, and broken down into specific things. So if you take recovery and self-care after birth, so recovery and self-care after birth was further broken down into, okay, you know, perennial care and hygiene, voiding, control of bleeding, postpartum exercises, if it's a cesarean delivery, breast care, hand hygiene, medications, and also some pointers for healthcare staff taking care of women. Um, so each of these broad areas were further broken down. And so then we took this content um, that resulted from the content development workshop and divide, um, created our focus CPC guide, right? So um, the guide was then developed from various evidence-based sources. So there was the Ghana Health Service policies um, and recommendations. There was the Ghana Health Service Maternal and Child Health Book. There was A1's um, Postbed Warning Science Education Program, um, A1's Compendium of Postpartum Care. And for those of you who are not familiar with A1, that is the specialty organization for um, work in this area. So it's um, Association of Women's Health Obstetric and Neonatal Nurses. And then also, um, so all of these evidence-based sources, um, content was drawn from these sources to create the guide. And then the guide went through various levels of expert review, from the regional to the district to the um, facility level. Um, and so all of these different levels of review were done for us to come up with the finalized focus postpartum guide. And this is the cover um, of the guide. So once we had the guide that was then endorsed by Ghana Health Service at the regional level, we needed to create audio and visual content, right, based on content in the guide. Um, because, I mean, these women that we are serving um, are not highly educated, and we wanted them to be able to be, understand the content and also be engaged, right, um, during focus PPC sessions. So um, we created videos and flashcards, and I mean, what's on the screen, these are examples of the flashcards. Um, they are just more like, I don't know what we call it here, poster, um, poster cards, but then they call it flashcards in Ghana. Um, and then translation of that content into the local language, which is Dagbani. So this is just um, a video, an example of a voiceover in the local language. Azara Kayuna, Nubia, Azara Nerad, Ama Brazan, let the man, Kayuna, Azara Nerad, Ama Brazan, let the man, Kayuna, Azara Nerad, Ama Brazan, let the man, Kayuna, Azara Nerad,
ka lato pam anta azara ubu bang den sahle lala tia ma den tu yuge azara nangu nani hai ke pa ba kwe balam kwe jwa na dimi iti nang ka den nang da can we stop it yeah thank you so i'm not going to play the whole thing but just to give you an idea um that you know of what that um audio resource would look like So then um, once all of these, the, these steps were taken, then we went ahead to implement the Focus BPC model of care. So Focus BPC is just an integrated group postpartum care education and support model. It has three components, postpartum clinical assessment, um, and these are the recommended clinical assessments by the World Health Organization, which has been adopted by Ghana Health Service. Um, physical assessments for the, we provided physical assessments for the first six weeks and continued to provide vital signs up until 12 months after delivery. So this was what um, our model did in addition to the status quo, right, that we were measuring vital signs every month up until 12 months after delivery. And um, physical assessments included the recommended standard assessment, um, vital signs, fundal assessment, vaginal bleeding, breast soreness, incisions, etc. And then postpartum education. The content of focused postpartum um, care education was on the unique needs of postpartum women based on time frame after delivery, using our focused postpartum care guide um, and the audiovisual resources that we developed. And so, um, I mean, we know that with that one year after delivery, you know, what is more important for women to know within two weeks, at six weeks, at six months down the road. So um, our content was based on those unique needs of women, um, based on time frame after delivery. And then also um, women in the focus BPC groups uh, were able to discuss issues relevant to them and provide peer support to each other during these group sessions. Um, so this was a randomized control trial that was implemented in the four health centers in Tamale in the northern region of Ghana. We recruited potential participants during the third trimester of um, pregnancy. So um, participants were approached during that time and informed about the study but told that they would not be enrolled until after delivery. And so if they were interested, they inv provided initial consent consent at that time and gave us their follow-up contact information um, for us to be able to follow up with them after delivery. So once um, women delivered, then they were enrolled um, into the study. Um, at enrollment, after enrollment, the, we did um, the informed consent and a baseline survey, a baseline survey of everyone before they were then randomly assigned into the intervention or control group. So um, at the four health centers, we had a total of 48 participants um, at each health center, 24 in intervention, 24 in control. This was a parallel design. However, because this was a group model of care, the intervention group participants were in three groups of eight. So um, participants in the intervention arm um, received the focused postpartum care model, and participants in the control arm um, received standard um, postnatal care. So um, as I mentioned before, this was a group design. Group postpartum care sessions were held at one to two weeks, six weeks, and monthly thereafter, up until 12 months, following the Ghana Health Service schedule for PNC and child welfare clinic visits. So GHS recommends that women, you know, if everything happens at the facility, um, women should return to the health facilities for postpartum care within two weeks and at six weeks, and then after that, there's also child welfare clinics that happens every month at the facility up until 12 months. So we just followed um, those that um, recommendations and that model so that the women were coming back um, to the facility at those recommended time points. We, um, there was like 15 minutes of individual clinical assessment and counseling when women showed up, and then one hour approximately of group time dedicated to education and support. 
group sessions were led by two trained midwives, so these were registered midwives working in those health centers. The entire protocol for this um, intervention has been published, um, and so you can feel free to take a look at it if you're interested in um, the details of the study protocol. So um, there was a total of 14, a total of 13 visits, right? One to two weeks, six weeks, and then every month um, up until four months. So that made it 13 visits. Um, so during each visit, um, in the first you know, six weeks, physical assessments and vital signs, and then after six weeks where you know, um, assessments of bleeding and fundal checks um, are no longer needed, but then they continue to receive measures of vital signs up until 12 months. And um, at each visit, we had a flashcard and videos to age in engagement and education, and then recommendations for what topics midwives needed to cover. So we had these recommendations um, and um, the guide for the midwives to educate women, but then the midwives were also free to educate on other topics that they felt like the group needed at that time. And so let's say, you know, this is their six-week visit and they're educating on common complications and self-care and social support, but then they realize that a lot of the women have questions on breastfeeding. They would talk about breastfeeding as well. So this was a guide. Um, we really designed this model to address certain gaps in practice that we had seen, right? And one was care of the mother in addition to the baby. So um, we had seen in the setting that, you know, um, PNC or postnatal care was heavily newborn focused, and also our needs assessment with the women in that setting confirmed this that. Um, there needed to be care of the mom in addition to what was already happening to the baby. Um, we provided physical assessments and mental health assessments, which was not uh, really happening before. Standardized postpartum education and support until 12 months um, after delivery. It also provided relationship building between midwives and participants. Um, and you know, at some point, you know, those. We really had to address those negative interpersonal relationships that participants um, talked about um, and make sure that you know there was that welcoming environment in our focused postpartum care sessions. And participants and midwives really built um, cordial relationships and they could reach out to their midwives at any point in time if they had consent. There had to be training and support for the midwives um, because in prior descriptive studies, the I had found that there were gaps uh, relating to postpartum care and education. So we needed to provide training and support for the midwives to be able to implement this model of care. So these are just some um, additional pictures from our sessions. You can see that you know there were measures of vital signs, head to toe physical assessments, newborn care, and you know um, our education session. So this is just a brief 30 second. Um, video um, on a focus postpartum care session. So that was just to give you, um, you know, brief visual for what those um, sessions would look like. Um, so we had certain um, outcomes that we measured, I mean, besides independent variables, uh, we were looking at knowledge of post-bed warning signs, um, which was our primary outcome. We um, had measures related to postpartum health behaviors, 
uh, specifically for that diet and family planning. Uh, we looked at postpartum health status, so questions on complications experience, um, perceived stress scale, and the Edinburgh postnatal depression scale. Um, and in the end, we held focus groups with midwives and participants in the focus BPC arm um, to look at acceptability and satisfaction. So all of our data was managed by a statistician on the team, and she's the one who conducted all of the analysis. Um, so let me go into some of our results at this point. At baseline, um, you know, so this is the, I think, blue color represents control. The coral color represents intervention group um, for the slide and following slides. And um, baseline participant characteristics were pretty similar between intervention and control groups. Most participants were married, um, about half did not attend school, and um, about half um, didn't have a source of income. And it is important to note that there was no significant difference at baseline between intervention and control group participants. Also, um, at baseline um, with obstetric history, um, characteristics were similar, and again, there was no significant difference in baseline obstetric history between intervention and control group participants. Um, majority of women had a vaginal delivery. Most women delivered with a nurse, um, midwife. Midwives are the primary maternity care providers in this setting, so that is expected. Um, and you know, doctors would perform C-sections and take on higher level um, care. Uh, it was the first pregnancy of you know roughly 36, 31 um, participants, and then the rest um, had multiple pregnancies. Um, going for weighing is the term for prenatal care. And uh, most women said that they were planning to breastfeed their babies after delivery. So with our first um, outcome on knowledge of postbed warning signs, um, at baseline, okay, um, there wasn't a significant difference at baseline between intervention and control groups on the warning signs of postbed um, of on the warning signs that we looked at, and. These were the nine post warning signs that A1 um, has put out that women need to know um, after delivery. So we base our study on A1 post warning signs, which is pain in chest, obstructed breathing or shortness of breath, seizures, thoughts of hurting yourself, severe bleeding, incision taking too long to heal, swollen leg or pain in leg, fever, high temperature, severe headache. Um, so no significant difference between intervention and control group at baseline. At one to two weeks, the focused postpartum care participants saw um, we saw an increased um, knowledge of postbed warning signs compared to control group participants, um, and that um, in, um, knowledge gap continued to increase um, over time. By three months, almost 99 to 100% of focused postpartum care participants were identifying every warning sign as opposed to very little numbers in the control group. And the knowledge was you know, sustained um, at six months in the focused postpartum care group. And so um, the general trend was that knowledge decreased over time in the control group while knowledge increased um, over time in the intervention group by up until three months and sustained at six months. This is another um, visual on knowledge. This is just looking at it um, by the different health facilities that were involved. And so for Baga Baga Falcon Hing Kanfali Health Centers, control group knowledge remained level while focused PTC knowledge increased. Um, and in Chogu, control group knowledge decreased while um, knowledge in the focused postpartum care group was retained over time. Alongside knowledge, we also looked at confidence, um, participants' rating of their confidence and their ability to recognize complications. So the first one was the warning signs, right? These were the actual complications. So preeclampsia, blood clots in veins, hemorrhage, infection, blood clots in lung, disease in the heart, hypertension, postpartum depression. Um, confidence increased over time 
um, in the focus postpartum care group for every complication, while confidence decreased over time in the control group. And again, those colors remain the same with the coral color being the intervention group and the blue color being the control group. And um, I think this would not be surprising that, you know, along with knowledge and confidence, um, that the focus postpartum care um, would say that they were educated on warning signs of complications um, as opposed to the control arm. So this was on postpartum education on complications. More focused postpartum care than control participants were taught about um, by midwives about complication at every time point after baseline. And also participants, more participants in the focused postpartum care arm said they were told where to go if they experienced complications at every um, time point than control participants. All right, so moving on to postpartum health behaviors. Um, these are results on both knowledge um, of the four-star diet and use of family planning. So the four-star diet is, uh, is something that is um, an indicator that uh, Ghana Health is interested in, and it's pretty much um, eating of a balanced diet, uh, similar to my place in the U.S. I'm not sure if Canada has um, a similar program that's like, okay, you have to eat food from these four. Um, food categories, right, to make up a balanced diet. So that is the four-star diet. So the focus postpartum care group has higher knowledge of the four-star diet at every time point compared to the control group. That is the top graph here. Um, but it's not just knowledge. It's also translated into eating a four-star diet. So that's not presented here. But more women in the focus postpartum care groups were actually eating a four-star diet. Um, during um, a week compared to women in the control group. The bottom chart um, here is on use of family planning methods, and that is another indicator that Ghana Health Service is interested in. Uh, and we can see that, I mean, at six weeks, I mean, no one was really thinking about family planning at this time, right? But when we get to three months where um, likelihood of getting ovulating and getting pregnant again increases, uh, more women in their focus postpartum care group started going on family planning methods as opposed to the control group. And by um, 12 months, about a third of the focus postpartum care participants were all on, were on family planning um, as opposed to just nine participants in the control group. Um, so with clinical assessments, as I mentioned, everyone in the focus postpartum care model received clinical assessments. Um, unfortunately, it was just the focus postpartum care participants that received this. So um, this is just presenting results on descriptive results on um, women who were in the intervention group. Almost half of all women had high blood pressure at the beginning of the study at one to two weeks, 46. Um, that number still remained high at six weeks. And I point this out because if care ends at six weeks, we are missing an opportunity to manage a lot of um, potential cases of blood pressure, potential complications. And that's why it's important that care extend beyond that six week time period up until 12 months. And you can see that you know the numbers continue to decrease and at 12 months, only 13 women um, still had a blood pressure over 130 over 80. Um, for stress, we measured stress using the perceived stress scale. And stress was pretty high in both groups um, right after delivery, which is expected. But then by three months, there was a significant difference in the stress levels between intervention and control group participants. And that was uh, maintained at six months. It wasn't until 12 months that the control group participants' stress level were beginning to catch up with the um, focus postpartum care group stress levels. Um, also, we screened for potential depression using the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale. And um, at three months, we saw that there was a significant difference in scores between um, intervention and control group participants. Um, but there were a lot of you know, potential cases that were identified and followed up on um, and managed by midwives in the intervention. So um, we contacted endline 
focus group discussions with the midwives and all of the focus group participants on acceptability and satisfaction, and we are currently um, analyzing that data. Um, so those results I'm not presenting today, they will be um, coming soon in the near future. In summary, um, I think that it is possible to engage and work with important stakeholders to develop context-relevant interventions for the provision of quality postpartum care and education for women after birth. We've seen that more frequent postpartum care contact with providers provides an opportunity for identification and management of potential complications, and that standardized postpartum education can improve knowledge of warning signs and practice of positive postpartum health behaviors, like eating a, you know, a balanced diet and taking up family planning. And with, we conclude that with implementation of focused postpartum care, that postpartum women can have improved health outcomes. Um, team acknowledgement, I'd like to acknowledge everyone that has been a part of this study. Um, Mr. Steve Aguino, who is my co-I and Executive Director of Savannah Signatures, all of the project assistants who worked with the midwives in Ghana, are uh, eight midwives who participated in the study are statistician and data scientists, our uh, OBGYN consultants from IU um, School of Medicine, my research assistants who worked tirelessly, tirelessly on this project, and our project manager in Ghana. So thank you. Um, if you'd like to learn more about my program, my research and this study in particular, uh, my website is yjadams. That's why Adams at ND. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joyce. That was uh, very enlightening, and it, it seems to have made quite a big impact. So, congratulations on your results. Thanks. Great. So, you talked. Uh, I'll just begin by starting with a question. You talked a lot about um, the patients, uh, the women themselves who had given birth. Um, could you talk a little bit about the, uh, the education for the providers as well and how they were taught to recognize the warning signs and so on? Yes. Um, so first off, the midwives are professionally trained. So these are trained midwives. Um, they are employed by the health facilities that we work in, so they have that background. But in addition to their midwifery education and training, um, we had to provide one training in what it means to have a randomized control trial because, <laughs> um, I mean, there are some things that needed to be adhered to with intervention fidelity and all of that. So um, we provided training on that. We provided training on the model itself um, and what we were trying to achieve. And then um, all of the midwives had to participate in A1 post-birth education program. So A1 is Association of Women's Health Obstetric and Neonatal Nurses, and they've come up with um, a post-birth education program for um, hospitals to participate in and have their postpartum nurses trained to provide standardized education to patients. Um, so all of the midwives participated in that education program. Um, also with mental health, which is a huge gap in the setting, um, the midwives have to participate in postpartum support international PSI frontline provider training on mental health and receive certificates in that. Um, and then, in addition, we had, you know, just ongoing engagement with them throughout the period of the study. Great. And just in terms of follow-up, so very promising results. Yeah. Um, how, how do you see, do you see this being uh, disseminated beyond the study, like to the actual healthcare system? And then what about other countries? Because, you know, even high-income countries, we have yeah. problems. Absolutely. Um, great question. That is the goal. Um, the goal is for this to eventually be adopted by GHS and become, you know, standard care. Um, so we're we are working on it. Our next immediate step is, so this uh, guide was endorsed at the regional level. So our immediate step is to work with Ghana Health Service at the national level to have um, revise the guide and have it endorsed at that level um, so that it can be that, you know, um, facilities 
nationwide would be able to use um, the guide if it's endorsed at that level. Um, we also have intentions of, you know, seeking funding and setting up an in-service training center where then facilities can have cohorts of midwives come to receive additional training in postpartum care and education and then be able to roll out um, this model in their respective facilities. So um, that is all future work um, that, that's coming up that we're working towards. But you did mention um, other countries and absolutely this model can be adapted um, and to other countries and I'm working on actually um, adapting this for the U.S. because that's where I'm based. Um, I have, you know, a couple of local partners, um, health system partners in Indiana that we are having discussions right now on what a group postpartum care model would look like in our setting um, and to be able to implement something like this in Indiana. Um, we know that when it comes to maternal mortality, the U.S. actually has really uh, one of the countries with worse maternal health outcomes. Um, so interventions that happen in low and lower middle income countries can be, you know, adapted for high income countries as well because, I mean, you know, issues cut across board. You know, some of the issues that we see there are applicable to the U.S., to Canada, um, other um, countries. So this model is designed in a way that it has four components. One, um, frequent, more frequent care provided. So um, the U.S., for example, postpartum care right now is just like a six-week visit, right? Um, and so this model would provide for more frequent contact beyond that six-week visit. Two, extended period of care beyond six weeks up until one year after birth. Um, three, standardized education. And four, group setting and peer support. And so this can be, that is the focus for spasm care model. So this model can be adapted to fit Canada, to fit any um, country at all. And so we welcome partnerships um, from every country, anywhere that's willing to adapt this model to their context and we work with them to do that. Right, I guess in the US the question is access to health insurance sometimes though. So. Yes, it is. Um, but then the good thing is that um, Medicaid is being extended for one year okay. after birth. And yeah. so some states, a couple of states have already um, um, opted into that, and Indiana is one of them. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Emma. Thank you, Professor Adams, for the fascinating study and, and looking at uh, health from a broader perspective than just the physiological health, but also the, the psychosocial component of it. So thank you for your work. And, uh, and I'm uh, really excited to see that you had these connections to the Ghana Health Service and, and working on a policy level. Uh, I'm sure the question that comes up from uh, the, the ministries is the, uh, the additional cost required for the HR for the contact time, which is substantially increased as far as I can tell between the standard NPC model and the focus PPC model. So did you collect cost data as part of this evaluation? And if not, could you estimate if this program was deployed at scale, what would be the percentage increase uh, for a focused PPC versus standard NPC? Yeah, so what we then do um, in this implementation um, analysis, right, um, but that is very important. So in our next implementation, um, we already have an economist that we've brought on board to the team that we plan to make this a major um, thing to look at the, um, you know, cost analysis for this. But um, I, I think that it is possible because GHS already has recommendations, right, that saying, you know, women should return within two weeks and at six weeks. And then there's the CWC visit every month up until 12 months. So what it needs, what needs to happen is the integration of PNC and CWC. Because if the women come for CWC, right, and that's what we did, that, you know, then they can receive care for themselves as well, in addition to what's happening at CWC for their baby. Yeah. Okay, great. So there, there are existing practices that could be leveraged to That could be leveraged, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Okay. Um, I mean, it's going to take, I mean, of course, it will come at a higher cost, right? Um, I can't put a number to it right now. Did you now. speculate on, like, um, percentage-wise? <laughs> park? Um, it's difficult to, to do. Um, yeah, 
but but the potential is there given that those structures are already there and i think that i mean it's, it's going to be using um, community health um, nurses i think for this to go at scale because <coughs> most of the people at cwc are the community health um, nurses right um we've also when i was in canada this summer we had um, a capacity building session with midwives and some of the things that they also mentioned or brought up was that um, this could potentially be taken to the women um, in their communities as opposed to them coming to the facility using the community health nurses. So there's different ways to be able to look at it when it comes to skill, but the potential is there. Great, thank you. Yes. Yes, and I imagine you'd need uh, you know, uh, training more midwives as part of that, part of the cost. Yes. Yeah. yeah, you just yeah. have to ramp up the health services uh, personnel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But needed, so that's great. Um, other questions or comments? Yes. Yes, thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, I, as you did your presentation, certainly uh, I was looking at the method. Uh, components and I was surprised in terms of loss to follow up uh, how did you control for that because it appears that uh, at the initial stage and at the end point the numbers were probably almost the same and so uh, how, how, how did you ensure that you could follow these uh, participants uh, over the 12 months without necessarily losing any of them, or if you did lose mm -hmm. one or two, how did you uh, get them back, right? Yes, right. So that, that, that's my first question. The second, I know you've not developed manuscripts uh, on that from the statistical point of view, but I was wondering with regards to the standardized education, how uh, women who are most powerful, uh could impact on your findings, right? If I've had uh, two, three children uh, before the one I'm having, I've acquired some experience, I've acquired some knowledge, mm -hmm. and so how can I really tell, or how can you really tell that it's probably the focus uh, intervention that has uh, made such an impact, yeah. right? And uh, yes, yeah, uh, you, you could. Uh, okay. Respond. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, is there a way to connect my computer for the screen to share? Oh, no? Okay. That's, I was just going to show you a console chart, because yeah. um, then that would um, answer your question on loss to follow up. But I'll give you, um, we, we had very, I mean, relatively low attrition um, in our intervention group. But I think the what was more common was people missing sessions as opposed to dropping out entirely. Um, and so you would have maybe a session that somebody would not show up uh, and then show up at the next session. So that happened. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of attrition, I think that so um, allocated to intervention was 96. And um, at baseline, analyze was 96. At one to two weeks, analyze was 84. Um, so that's because women were missing sessions, right? So that's the one component. But um, loss to follow up, we lost track of one participant, and then four participants discontinued the intervention um, because they were moving to a different place mid-study. So that's five. In the control group, we had one lost to follow up and one that lost interest. So that's two. Um, and then before we actually started the intervention, we had um, five participants that didn't receive the intervention at all from baseline because we couldn't reach them. So that's the number. So I mean, so relatively <laughs> low attrition rate. Um, and I think, I don't know, if I'm going to explain it, I'll say they, they enjoyed the <laughs> sessions, they enjoyed the peer support, um, the rapport that they built with the midwives. 
Um, but I mean, I'll see what comes up in our focus group discussions with the participants in terms, I think that the satisfaction and acceptability had a role to play. That's what I think. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's a good explanation. I'm wondering in terms of the multi Okay, moment, right. Uh, um, um, I, I, I do, I, we are working on publications right now and all of the analysis. Um, and Jessica, I think that she did look at the demographic, like, um, characteristics and obstetric history in the model um, that she did. So, yes, we did factor that in. So there, there, there was one other, but I'm, I'm wondering in terms of uh, quality of maternal care, uh, if probably it would be a suggestion, if you consider probably looking at that, it could be a measure that uh, you could come up with based on uh, this focus model, yeah. that way you're able to assess and determine whether uh, these healthcare professionals are providing yeah. the, the, that, the kind of care we expect, right? And if you have sort of a measure or a skill or a construct that could make that assessment, that could go a long way, especially since you intend uh, extending your project at the national level and possibly uh, at the continental level, it, it'll enable or it'll facilitate easy assessment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you for the suggestion. Anyone online or? Yeah, time. I might go for a quick question. Yeah. So you talked about the three. Thank you for the presentation. We talked before, so it was very good to see what you were working on. Um, in terms of the third component, peer support. So most of the peer support is being provided by the midwives, or is it is the is the group? Uh, is there any um, opportunity for mothers to provide support to other mothers? And that kind of ties in with Imran's question where there's a cost, cost is a massive factor. Um, did you look into that? Is that an option at all or? Yeah, so um, the peer support was more month to month oh, okay. support. Um, just because this was a group setting, they had, they built friendships, they had um, discussions about things oh, that God. they wanted to talk about. Um, so on some of, like uh, during our focus group person peer sessions, we had time for, you know, um, peer support questions, things that they wanted to talk about. You know, maybe somebody will bring up, oh, this is what I'm experiencing, and then all of them will be like, oh, you know, I this is what I did, this is what, and so, um, there were times even when, you know, somebody will bring up, oh, I know that this other person is experiencing this, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's not like the person who said it themselves because they built that friendship um, with each other. We have uh, data that our project assistants were documenting what was going on during peer support, but I've not take, we've not um, looked at that data in detail yet. May I? Yes, go ahead. Um, are there any sort of culturally, you know, like for example in India, the the women, the daughters would go and live with their mothers um, during and after delivery. Are, are there any culturally like already exist in existence um, sort of interventions that people already are practice? Yeah, um, I mean lots of practices, um, but I, I in in the setting where we did the work the culture is for the in-laws to take care of the mom, the new mom and baby. So the husband's family. So the mom in law, sister in laws, um, they have a lot of power. And so that's why um looking at and talking about social support um <laughs> was actually very important. We had cases where with stress and potential depression screening cases where related to issues at home with sisters-in-laws, mom-in-laws, um, and all of that. So that's a whole new, another area where um, there should be a lot more done with bringing in um, these people into the healthcare 
of women so that the support that they are presenting to the woman is actually the type of support that she needs as opposed to what they think she needs. Uh, we've done focus group discussions before with mothers-in-laws and sisters-in-laws and it was an interesting dynamic with what they were thinking and the things that they were saying, right, um, <laughs> that um, they thought, you know, this is what I'm supposed to do, this is how I'm supposed to help. That may not necessarily be beneficial to the, to the woman. But then there are also a couple of practices, um, with some practices that women perform and so some of those things are also discussed during sessions um, for what is beneficial and what may not be. Thank you. Okay, um, well, I don't see any other questions, so I have an, another question. So uh, I'm actually doing some research on the antenatal period in Sub-Saharan Africa looking at performance accountability around infectious disease, so HIV, AIDS, TB, malaria, oh to see are women being assessed and then either given preventative treatment or, or yeah, treated uh, mm -hmm. so that there's no transmission of, for example, AIDS to the child and those mm -hmm. kinds of things. And not a lot of research, actually. N not a lot of studies and not a lot of around that. And I'm wondering, was that incorporated in your postpartum guidelines as well around infectious disease? Um, we did not. For the, it wasn't like an intentional <laughs> incorporation right. um, in this particular model. Although we didn't have any, like we didn't exclude women with HIV, um, I don't think that the women who get into the study, like we didn't have any oh, I um, see. Yeah. who was HIV, yeah, we didn't, but it wasn't like that we, we excluded right. um, them or anything. I mean, malaria, very common. <laughs> Um, so those cases were managed um, infections, yes. Mm -hmm. But HIV, you no. Know. Yeah. But yeah, you. I'm interested. Yeah, I mean, because they need, you know, it's probably a small subsegment of the population, but nevertheless, they still need specific care to. Right. Yeah, and yeah. their outcomes and, and their mm -hmm. children. And I mean, if if there are. You know, if there were anyone or if there's anyone, right, um, who has HIV um, and is coming for postpartum care, that should be incorporated into their individual right. um, care. So that would be something that would be included in the individual counseling time um, as opposed to, you know, um, unless it was like, you know, a whole group of HIV positive moms. Right, yeah. right. Okay. Which is also possible it's to possible. do, right? Yeah. That yeah. you know, um, you could have a whole group of HIV positive moms that has support with that. Yeah, share with each other. Yeah, and share so with on. each other. Yeah. 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 There is one more question. Go ahead. Or did? Oh, sorry. I thought you. Maybe you were scratching or something. I thought. No. no okay. <laughs> sorry. That's comments. Everyone has a chance. Okay, well, Joyce, that was really, really interesting. And um, I congratulate you on, you know, undertaking this research, working closely with Ghana Health Services. Um, and, oh, well, maybe there's one question I had around uh, Savannah Signatures. So could you tell me a little bit about that organization? Is that, yeah, I'll leave it to you. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, um, so they are a impact organization. Um, they've been working in the setting since 2009 doing work on reproductive health, education, maternal child health. Um, their main focus is technology, um, but then you know, they do a lot of work. They have a really good relationship with Ghana Health Service. So if you go to Tamale and you know, you say, oh, Savannah Signatures Related Work, it's like, oh, welcome, right? Because they've, <laughs> um, they've been doing this work in the setting for long enough that GHS, they've built that trust and relationship with GHS and with the communities in which they work in. So, right. I, yeah, I just, you know, um, we tend to partner with academic institutions for research and um, 
I think this was a different model, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, partnering not with an academic institution, but with a class organization that's doing work in the setting and already has that build trust. And are they only in Ghana or elsewhere? Yes. Just in Ghana? Just in yes. Ghana. Yes. Okay, yeah, seems like a great partnership. Yes. So. Well, okay. thank you again so much. Really exciting uh, findings and great research. So um, I wish you as much success in your you know, you're going to keep doing the research and looking to disseminate uh, the findings, so, and hopefully implementation, which is an academic dream, right? <laughs> so that's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Okay. Okay, and I would like to say thank you, everyone, for joining today. Um, so uh, next week there is no seminar because we're on reading week, but the following week, October 18th, we have the Planetary Health Film Lab, uh, 2023 debrief, the Belize edition with Mark Terry. So I look forward to seeing you all there. Okay, thanks.